The last part of the notes for 312 are on the Laffer curve and supply side policy, and then there's one FRQ we'll take a quick look at. So the Laffer curve was developed by an economist called Arthur Laffer, and it was developed in basically the early 1980s uh, during the Reagan administration. I actually believe he, he developed it when Reagan was running for office. So the idea of the Laffer curve is pretty simple. Um, the axes are tax revenue and tax rate. Now, if you want it to look this way, you can have, uh, you need to have tax revenue on the x-axis. It is possible to draw the Laffer curve where you have tax revenue on the y-axis and rate on the x-axis, but if you do that, you need to draw your curve like that. So you need to be careful. You can't mislabel the axes when you're drawing the curve. So I generally advise people to keep it this way, um, put the rate on the y-axis because we usually put things like interest rate on the y-axis which makes it easier to remember and then tax revenue is going to go on the x-axis. So the basic principle of the Laffer curve is that if you have a 0% tax rate you will have zero tax revenue. If you have a 100% tax rate you will also have zero tax revenue because people will lose all incentive to work. All right? If you work all day and the government gets 100% of your income well, then you have a pretty good reason to be pretty lazy, right? You're not going to have a big incentive to work if you don't get to see any of the rewards. So if you look at the lower part of the curve, again, it's pretty much common sense. As tax rates go up, tax revenues will also go up. The higher the tax rate, 5% is going to collect more money than 2%. 10% is going to collect more money than 5%. So as we move up this line, tax rates are increasing and tax revenues are increasing. But part of Arthur Laffer's theory was that there is some sort of limit here. There is this maximum revenue point, which he's calling M. And beyond that point, any additional increases in tax rate begin to harm incentives. And when you begin to harm the incentive to work, then people work less, they earn less, and your tax revenues go down. So if you continue on this route, well, we're going to do it with higher tax rates, higher tax rates, you will continue to get lower and lower tax revenues. So this was one of the theories behind supply-side economics. And the idea was he made the argument that we're already past that point. We are past our point of maximum tax revenues. Well, if that's true, then some pretty important things follow, right? I mean, if we're here at N, then we could actually cut tax rates, which makes people happy, right? And that would increase tax revenues, which is, of course, better for the government, right? They'd have higher tax revenues, and people would be happy because they have lower tax rates. So if we were at point N, then it would be a great policy decision to reduce tax rates, right? There'd be no, no problem with it, no negative side effects. So that was part of the supply side economics idea was we're going to cut tax rates and we will see tax revenues go up. And so under Reagan, tax rates were cut and tax revenues did not go up, tax revenues went down. So there's a couple different conclusions we can draw from that. The most obvious conclusion is that we were below this point, right? I mean, if, if you're buying into this graph. So you, if you cut tax rates and you find that tax revenues go down, right, right, that's one way of explaining it, is that we would simply weren't at that point, that he thought we were at maximum tax revenue point, and we actually weren't. Another way, of course, is just to say the whole curve doesn't make any sense, but we know that the, the, that the zero point and the hundred point, we know these points make sense. We know they're true. So one other explanation possibly is that the curve looks more like this, that it's more like a boomerang, right? That people are actually willing to pay more and more for a much longer period of time than we think, and then when they lose the incentive, they sort of lose it all at once. They don't really lose it until we get to, say, 90%, right? That's also a possibility. So we don't really know. It's also possible that our tax system is so complicated that we don't really know what would happen. Um, there has been shown in some rather small-scale research that for the top, like, 5% of income earners, if you cut their tax rates, they actually do pay higher tax revenues. So there is some evidence to suggest that, you know, he's not crazy, it's not completely wrong, um, but it didn't work as a whole, you know, whole economy sort of solution. So that's the Laffer curve. Um, the last piece on here in these notes for today is this uh, FRQ from 2013. And we're not really going to do it right now, but I just want you to see how it fits in. So it points out that inflation and expected inflation are part of what goes on, part of economic activity. A is draw a correctly labeled graph of a short run Phillips curve. So that was what you did in the first video. You learned about, you should know what the x-axis is. Remember, it should be unemployment because the long run Phillips curve needs to be at the natural rate of unemployment. So x-axis is unemployment, y-axis is inflation, and then you just draw that downward sloping 
curve and call it the SRPC or the short run Phillips curve. Using that graph, show the effect of an increase in the expected rate of inflation. So we just talked about that, right? It's going to shift the Phillips curve up and to the right. What is the effect of the increase in the expected rate of inflation on the long run Phillips curve? It just moves us along the long run Phillips curve. The curve itself does not move. Given the increase in expected rate of inflation from part B, will the nominal interest rate on new loans increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? Well, now we're looking back at stuff from unit two, right? What happens when we expect higher inflation, we're going to have higher nominal interest rates. Will the real interest rate on new loans increase, decrease, or remain unchanged? It will remain unchanged. And then it gives you one more question, calculate the real interest rate. Okay, all of this you should be able to do now. Uh, there are a lot of questions on the AP test that we haven't used as FRQs because they included the Phillips curve. So I just wanted you to see how it's going to fit into the questions. And that is the end for today's lesson.